And once again, this is, this is what becomes crucial because a few white Americans actually listen to those voices and find their worlds changed. William Lloyd Garrison, the publicist who becomes abolitionism's brilliant, polarizing standard bearer, is converted through a series of encounters with articulate African Americans who manifestly deserved respect as well as sympathy. Uh, converted is, I think, the right word. Garrison described hearing a speech by Frederick Douglass. Douglass is an escaped slave who becomes the century's most searing and subtle critic of slavery. I believe there's a film of his life on the way. Um, Garrison describes listening to, to Douglas speaking and says, I shall never forget the extraordinary emotion it excited in my own mind. I never hated slavery so intensely as at that moment. This is classic revivalism, a very Protestant moral awakening, the gospel's power piercing and transfiguring the hearts of hardened sinners. Innocent blood is crying out from the ground. To ask abolitionists to wait, to be patient, Garrison said, was to tell the mother to gradually extricate her babe from the fire into which it's fallen. He's not a politician looking for workable solutions. He's a prophet, rousing his people from a death-like moral sleep to see the horrific evil that's in front of them. And so his fury is directed not just at the slavers, but at the gradualists. Slavery's watchdogs, he calls them, whose mealy-mouthed compromises give the slavers all the moral cover they need. Slavery was a sin, and all slaveholders, whether individually benevolent or not, bear a terrible and immediate guilt. The trouble is that this sort of moral outrage wasn't easily backed up with biblical citation. So you find, for example, one Presbyterian abolitionist who simply asserted that the whole Bible is opposed to slavery. The sacred volume is one grand scheme of benevolence. Beams of love and mercy emanate from every page, which sounds like an admission that he's got no case. Likewise, the freed slave and self-taught lay preacher whom we know only as Elizabeth, who condemned scripturians, as she called them, who would rather parse the text than meet God in their hearts. Some abolitionists accepted the logical conclusion and began to leave their Bibles behind. We know slavery's wrong, one Baptist minister argued, not because scripture says so, but as a matter of immediate moral consciousness. We just know. It's not too far from there to the abolitionist minister who in 1860 preached that slavery is not to be tried by the Bible, but the Bible by freedom. And this leads a fringe of abolitionists to open alienation from Christianity, amongst whom is Frederick Douglass himself. But importantly, there was another way out of this problem. Some abolitionists started to argue that the Bible's tolerance of slavery only applied in specific historical circumstances, or that Christ stayed silent on the subject for fear that an anti-slavery message would stir up conflict and drown out the gospel, or even that revelation is progressive, that God has only now judged the world ready to hear the truth that slavery is and must always be an evil. But these are not the strongest arguments possible. In debating terms, the pro-slavery party seemed to have the upper hand. But American slavery's fate wasn't decided by debate. Instead, trust progressively evaporated between the two halves of the nation, by the 1850s, the southern establishment felt that its so-called way of life was under siege by fools, fanatics, and barbarians, while the safeguards and rights that the southerners demands, chiefly the, 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 the return of escaped slaves, seem increasingly intrusive and unacceptable to the north. In 1860, Abraham Lincoln, an avowed abolitionist, is elected president on northern votes alone. 11 southern states respond by seceding from the United States. The North treats that as rebellion, and the resulting war lasted from 1861 to 65 and left over 600,000 people dead. So it turned out that the immediatists' warnings of wrath and blood had been true. When the war was almost over, Lincoln framed it as a divine judgment on the nation. He prayed for the fighting to end, but 
echoing Garrison, echoing the British abolitionists before him, he added, yet if God wills that it continue, that the war continue, until all the wealth piled by the bondsman's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with a lash shall be paid with another, drawn with a sword. As was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Instead, within weeks, it was over and Lincoln himself was dead. The victorious North dictated the terms. All slaves were freed, no compensation was paid in this one case, and black and white alike were granted citizenship. The century of systematic discrimination and segregation which would follow wasn't maybe much of an improvement, but no serious Protestant would ever actively defend slavery again. 